exciting new paper out today in the Lancet Regional Health. This is by Pinto Pereira and colleagues, and this is about long COVID in children and young adults, 11 to 17. And the authors here do something different than other surveys. They're not just going at one moment in time and seeing how many kids after COVID diagnosis have symptoms. No, no, no. They're following the same group of kids at multiple moments in time, three months, six months, and beyond to see how many kids have symptoms, do those symptoms get better and worse, and how many kids develop new symptoms, and does it vary if you've had COVID-19 and if you didn't. And that's what makes this paper great. It is not a cross-sectional study. It is a longitudinal study. And that's important when it comes to COVID-19 and long COVID. And I have to put it this way, it's not going to be a good week for the fear-monger long COVID types. So let's take a look at this paper. It's entitled, The Natural Course of Health and Well-Being in Non-Hospitalized Children and Young People After Testing for SARS-CoV-2, a Prospective Follow-Up Study Over 12 Months. And that's what they do. This looks at the United Kingdom. It looks between 2020 and 2021 at kids who have a PCR documented COVID test, po COVID test, and it compares the ones that had test positive and test negative. Let's get into it. This is the table one. And what table one is trying to show you is it's looking at all the children and young people who responded six months and 12 months post-test and their characteristics by being COVID-19 negative and positive. And it's roughly showing you that it looks like it's kind of balanced. This is different than the prior paper I reviewed on this channel. It looks pretty balanced in terms of socioeconomic deprivation, ethnicity, sex, between the negatives and the positives. Now, one thing I don't have a clear sense of because I don't really have a granular understanding of the United Kingdom is whether or not these were truly people coming in with symptoms getting tested or whether or not some of the people being tested might have been tested for other purposes, like the many requirements to have a negative COVID PCR before you were to travel, et cetera, et cetera, back in 2020, 2021. And so I'm not sure they're equally symptomatic at baseline. I think it's important to say right off the bat. And the other thing is they're all using the central PCR facility. They're not using home tests. Okay. That's also worth saying they feel sick enough that they think it's worth it to go get tested or they need that test result for something in their life. So there might be some differences there, but overall it looks quite balanced. They're following the people out in time. They're asking them a battery of questions about long COVID symptoms, all the symptoms that are the most common things you talk about, as well as quality of life. And this paper has some astonishing findings. Let's take a look. This is the first astonishing finding. There are only two symptoms that really show a consistent growth, that the authors put it, they, a consistent rise in the percent of people who are suffering from it. And on the left is COVID negative, on the right is COVID positive, we have shortness of breath, we have tiredness. And the dark bar are people who first reported it when they had the illness. Then the next bar, are people who first reported the symptom six months after the illness, and the next bar are people who first reported it 12 months. And the point you have to see here, the brilliant point of this figure, is that the black bar gets smaller over time. The middle color bar, the dark gray bar, gets smaller over time. And there's a new bar that gets added. So if you just think about it, everybody who has these symptoms is getting better. That's why the same color bar is getting smaller. And the reason the overall bar is getting bigger is that people who've never had symptoms are suddenly having symptoms, okay? That's what they're trying to show you here. We are putting out a message that long COVID is a permanent disabling, mass disabling event, I've heard it called. What they're saying is that the people who had it at baseline, they're getting better. And they're these new people who suddenly report this symptom of shortness of breath or tiredness, okay? That's very different than the same people having it for a long period of time. Because the question is, why are the new people getting it? Are they getting it because the virus after 12 months decided to come back and poke some, poke some organs and cause some damage? Or are they getting it because of all of the things they are meant to understand about long COVID from the media coverage? Are they getting it because of all the stressors in life, et cetera? And this paper doesn't fully answer the question, but it does raise that hypothesis. The next slide. There are a number of symptoms where the overall prevalence declined from baseline to 12 months in test positives, okay? Fever, of course. They all had it at baseline, it all got better. Chills, headache, loss of smell. This is important, loss of smell. Almost none of the COVID negative patients, and here they also exclude somebody who later were to develop COVID, none of these people had loss of smell, nearly none. And many of the people who had COVID had loss of smell. Why is that so important? That's actually something that's clearly linked to the virus. The virus loves the old factory bulb and it likes to do some damage up there. It causes loss of smell and taste. 
And if you don't have a lot of loss of smell and taste in the control group, it tells you they really never had COVID. They really never had COVID. They didn't have COVID at baseline. They didn't have COVID over the course of the year. They really never had COVID. Otherwise, you'd see some loss of smell in there, and you don't. Proves their studies well done, doesn't it? Dizziness, muscle pains. These things are getting better. The people who had dizziness at baseline, that dark bar is getting smaller. There's some new people who have dizziness at month 12. They're not the same people. They don't have persistent dizziness. It's a new group of people with de novo 12-month dizziness. Is that linked to the virus? I don't know. But these authors are pointing out the deficiency of cross-sectional study design. We're going to come to that. <clears throat> these are all symptoms where there was a low prevalence at testing six months and 12 months. And, you know, it's really hard to tell what's going on here. But some of them look at the chest pain. The COVID negative group has escalating chest pain. A higher percent has chest pain. But some of these people have a new chest pain. And I think here, once again, you see that all of these symptoms that people who had it at baseline, like eye soreness, those people feel better. There's just new people who have eye soreness all of a sudden. The sore eye, obviously, long COVID. This looks at quality of life and functioning. And what it shows you is these are people in whom quality of life and functioning are considered poor quality. And on mobility, self-care, pain, usual activities, feeling sad, it looks like a wash the people who tested negative and the people who tested positive. The prior paper was also similar. It said that if you didn't have COVID, but you had a different upper respiratory tract infection, you had symptoms, you actually had worse quality of life with the other respiratory tract infection. Now, I took a more conservative interpretation of that paper. I didn't say it was worse. I just said that COVID was not this demon that was like nothing we'd ever seen before. This, I say that even though the test negative group might include some people who are getting tested for bureaucratic purposes, so therefore, you would expect that they would have much less symptoms. These people have roughly comparable quality of life symptoms and comparable poor quality of life symptoms. And I think that's important. And some of the people who were doing poorly in the beginning are doing better with time. And again, on loneliness, you see this. Look at COVID negative patients. They're suffering from loneliness, even up to one in 10 of them. And COVID positive patients are actually suffering from loneliness too. And there's new loneliness along the way. And the people who were lonely in the beginning are getting less lonely over time. That's good. But loneliness is bad. And loneliness, we have to say, in some part, is because we've ruined the lives of children and young adults over a virus that didn't really have a high infection fatality rate in children and young adults. It never did. It, arguably, throughout all of human history, for thousands and thousands of years, no society would ever have rearranged the lives of children over a virus with this IFR. Only the modern congruence of a few factors, the rise of the tech culture and work from home, the ability to have high-speed internet, a bunch of companies that want to parasitize your time online, and the culture of safetyism and fear-mongering led to this particular unique response in this one moment in time. It wouldn't have happened that way in 1980, not 1970. This is emotional and behavioral difficulties, and what it shows you is that whether you're positive or negative, it's not insignificant, and I think that's important to know. And as far as I can tell, there's no clear link that the virus is causing the emotional and behavioral difficulties, but perhaps the imposition on the lives of children are resulting in that. So here's what the authors conclude. Most children and young people recovered from adverse symptoms which they experienced at baseline and six months post-infection. However, with the reporting of new onset of these same symptoms at six and 12 months follow-up by both test positive and test negative may be causally related to multiple factors and not just SARS-CoV-2. This highlights the need for appropriate control groups, and it blows up cross-sectional studies, okay? They're making two points here. One, when you look cross-sectionally at a group of 100 people and you say 10 have long COVID symptoms and then six months of 10 have long COVID symptoms, 10 have long COVID symptoms, that's not the same thing as saying it's the same 10 people because 10 people had, long, had symptoms like this, and then six of those 10 got better. But then a bunch of new people had symptoms and then a bunch of those people got better and then a bunch of new people got those symptoms. And when that pattern emerges, you have to ask yourself, is it the virus that somehow 12 months later is banging around the organs or is it the fact that life is so disrupted and all the things that make human beings enjoy life have been taken away from them for a prolonged time and it's not easy to be a child or a young adolescent. So I hear, so I hear. Those are my thoughts on this video. Those are my thoughts on this paper. It's a superb paper. I mean, why is it superb? They've got a control group and they've got longitudinal follow-up and it's prospective, okay? It's not a VA data set study where you're linking the PCR documented VA test, which by the way, most veterans are not going to the VA to get tested, to ICD-10 codes, which are administrative, 
bullshit. They're administrative bullshit. They're not actually a measure of how people feel or function. This is a good study, like the last study I covered on this channel, and and I have to commend the authors for a job well done. And those are my thoughts in this very quick video about the topic. It's in the Lancet Journal family, and you should take a look at it.